I'd named him Rufus. Cute, right? Rufus wasn't mine, but then does a cat really belong to anybody? They're free spirits. I believe they choose their people, and Rufus chose me. Rufus came at just the right time. Not long after mine and Tony's arguments got too much. After the trouble happened. The sirens, and after he got in the back of that car and left. Just as I was staring at a bottle of pills on the kitchen side and wondering how much longer I could go on for. If Tony couldn't live with me, then how could I live with myself? That noise. That single noise saved my life. And from that moment on, the cat just wouldn't stay away. He visited daily, greeting me at dawn with a loud meow at the kitchen door. Life was cold and dreary. I lived with a knot in my insides that never went away. The only thing I had to look forward to was Rufus. He'd brought a light that I'd forgotten even existed. Every morning, he trotted across my back garden and waited until I opened the door to give him some attention. He had no idea how lonely I was, how much I needed that tiny piece of affection. It was crisp and fresh the morning I received the first note. Rufus was late, and I'd started to panic. How sad is that? Standing aimlessly in my kitchen, wishing for a cat that wasn't mine just to turn up and say hello. I sipped that tea so slowly. I wanted to give him as much time as I could. I wanted to believe I hadn't been abandoned. Again. It came. I'd never felt relief like it. I opened the door, beaming, unable to shake the stupid grin from my face. I looked down at my fluffy friend and crouched to tickle his neck. Tucked between his leather collar and tufty black fur was a folded up piece of paper. I can't explain the anxiety I felt. Was it a note from the owner? Did they want me to keep away from their cat? Was someone else feeding him and they were blaming me? I hated confrontation. I'd stayed in my own lonely bubble for so long that the thought of communicating with a person gave me palpitations. Shaking, I unfolded the paper. I know your secret. Are you ready to repent? A friend. It was handwritten, not in nice cursive. The handwriting was more of a scrawl than a collection of letters, barely legible. I stood in the garden, surveying the rows of houses divided by fences that overlooked my patch of grass. My stomach churned. How could they? It had to be a joke, surely, some kind of sick prank. They couldn't have known the secret. I thought back to the night of all the trouble. Flashes of Tony in the back of my mind, telling me he was sorry, that it would all be okay, him being bundled into the back of the police car. The guilt. I said goodbye to Rufus, placed the note in a drawer, and locked the door behind me. Someone knew what happened that night. But they couldn't. It was just me and him. He wouldn't tell anyone. Who would listen to a man behind bars anyway? It was just a prank had to be. The next morning, I twirled my spoon in my tea and waited for that familiar meow. I'd slept terribly, tossing and turning in a pit of my own inebriated memories of the night it happened. I could feel the bags inflating beneath my eyes. I felt violated. My time with Rufus was my own personal sanctuary, and now it wasn't the escape it had once been. I should have known that my sins would catch up with me. People like me didn't deserve affection. There was Rufus. More paper under his collar. This time, that noise wasn't a lifesaver. This time, it made me want to pick up that bottle of pills all over again. To end it all. I scanned the houses, noting a sea of empty windows as I gently pulled the note from beneath the collar and unfolded it, quivering. I ruffled Rufus on the head and tried to swallow the lump in my throat as I backed into my kitchen, bolting the door. The scrawls were somehow more urgent this time, like the writer had pressed extra hard on the paper, almost tearing it in some places. There was no more mistaking it for a prank. Are you really going to let Tony rot for what you did? I told you. I know. Tick-tock. Your friend. I dropped the note 
mouth agape. Was this Tony? Had he gotten sick of the prison food and communal showers and told a buddy or family member what happened? I thought about calling the police, but how could I explain something like that? I'd have to tell them he took the fall for me that night. I'd be walking myself straight into a cell. I spent the day in a panic, trying to work out what to do. My brain wouldn't function. Instead, it played a cinematic reel of all the parts of that night I remembered. The shouting. The drinking. The moment I took my eyes off the road to scream at him a little more. The impact. I was a sitting duck. The third morning came, and so did another note. I was a wreck by then, hadn't slept in three days, and could barely stay balanced on my feet. I ushered Rufus in, took the note, and shooed him back out. I wanted to cuddle him, to hold him. Rufus had been such a positive thing in my life. Not anymore. Now he just brought fear and pain. Pain that I tried so hard to bury. This time, there were jagged tears in the paper. The words extended angrily in places they shouldn't. You can't hide from me. You and Tony weren't alone that night and you won't silence me any longer. You won't get away with what you did to me. There was no sign off this time. No mention of being a friend. I tore it to pieces. Impossible. It was fucking impossible. The road was empty that night, not a soul for miles. The only other witness. The victim. The girl I didn't see as I turned to scream at Tony. She was dead. I killed her. She didn't die on impact, but we knew she was done for. Tony said she couldn't be saved. That's why we drove away. Better to preserve two lives than ruin three trying to save one. That's what he said. I listened. I looked at her, gasping for air on the floor, and I saw my own ruined life. I, I hate myself for it, I really do, but I, I didn't see her for a second. That's why we pushed her into the grassy embankment and left her there to die. The police found the body the next day, already being picked apart by animals at the roadside. I may have killed her, but getting caught was Tony's fault. He was the one that dropped his wallet. This was his fault! What a cruel twist of fate that was to leave your contact details right next to the dead teenage girl. Or was it a valiant act of karma? I sobbed. I hugged my knees into my chest tightly. Maybe I just needed to come clean. Tell the police that I was the one driving that night. That Tony was just trying to protect me. Or was it too late? Was it actually her? Would I even be safe in prison? I buried my head in the sand. My duvet became my cocoon. I wondered if Tony was eating. Did he regret taking my place? The next morning, I didn't go downstairs. I heard Rufus mewing beneath my bedroom window, confused as to why he'd been abandoned. It broke me, but I didn't move. I couldn't. I was paralyzed. If I never collected the note, then it didn't exist. I wish that theory had been correct. I really do. My phone rang, jolting my entire body like an electrocution. I let it ring, determined to wallow in my own guilt. I was doing this to myself, that's what I'd convince myself. I just needed a day off. The phone reached answer phone, and a girl's voice came through the receiver. Tick tock. Tick tock. I covered my ears with my pillow but I couldn't sniff it out entirely. She repeated it so many times, I started to hum, trying to block it out, but I couldn't. She was coming for me. I played that broken memory in my mind again. That argument. I'd been so angry. I was so upset that Tony had been texting someone else. So consumed by it. If I'd never taken my eyes off the road, she would be alive. That's why he took the fall. The cheating bastard. He was sat in prison for the crime of cheating on his girlfriend. He didn't kill that girl. He didn't veer off that road. He didn't drink six double vodkas before he got behind the wheel. That was my fault. I'm sorry, I muttered, alone in my room, desperate for whoever it was to hear me, for her to hear me. 
I had to atone for my sins. I had to confess. I sobbed, sat in my bed for hours, sobbing and apologizing to the air. I was sorry. I didn't mean it. Hours passed and I waited. There's nothing more frightening in this world than waiting. Waiting for an unknown fate. An unknown vengeance. Unsure if it's the doing of something real or your own guilty mind. I heard it just after it got dark. The whimpering from outside. I peered out of a small gap in my bedroom curtain. Into my back garden. There she was. Arms splayed out. Bones broken and blood splattered across her clothes, exactly the same way it was that night. Exactly how she looked before we pushed her down the embankment. She wasn't gasping this time, though. Instead, staring right back at me, gently mouthing, tick-tock. I'm not sure what she's going to do. I know she wants me to suffer. She's biding her time. Waiting there, with her limbs all mangled, a stark reminder of what I'd done. Every now and again, I peer out that gap in the window, waiting for her next move, but it never comes. Last time I looked, there was Rufus, chewing on her bloodied finger. <laughs> <laughs>